I do want to point out that it is interesting that they are touting the security of the Ethereum network right before we go through a transition on Ethereum that basically makes it less secure based on the price of Ethereum. I've been thinking about this a lot more and I'm, I'm going to be working a little bit more on a talking head video for the idea. <clears throat> but the base idea that I brought up before that I think is important to consider and this coffee, I think has some MCT oil in it. So excuse my throat. Um, the, the, the problem is this, is that your incentive structure for security gets really jacked up with proof of stake, especially as it's being implemented by Ethereum. Uh, and that is because you are incentivized as a staker. If the price of the coin is low, your primary revenue comes from the price of the coin going up. So if you have a staked amount of ETH and the price goes up, you're more incentivized as the price goes up and demand for the network goes up to sell off uh, your investment, your stake. That stake is specifically what is providing the security for the network. As opposed to that, when you look at proof of work, and this is just a very basic security incentive argument, when you look at proof of work, when the price of Ethereum goes up, you want to buy more cards. This is why traditionally you see a correlation on proof of work networks with the price, meaning the price of whatever said proof of work coin goes up, so does the hash rate on the network. They correlate in that manner. This is uh, completely reversed when we're talking about proof of stake because your primary investment is the coin itself. So as the coin goes up in price, you're incentivized to sell it off, thereby decreasing the security on the network. This is also more than likely why Ethereum has set it up to where, at least initially, there is no uh, withdrawals enabled for staking. At least if you're not going through a third party and if you're going through a third party, well, then you do not control, of course, your keys and you're not really staking at that point. But it's a whole other rabbit hole that we could go down and it continues because like oh, the big argument for, of course, staying on Ethereum for ApeCoin is going to be the security, which is enabled by proof of work. Now we have them also having the issue of needing to solve scalability, which they can't solve currently on Ethereum. So what has happened to Ethereum, ETH 2.0? What's going on with sharding? Is any of this actually in the works anymore? Because if we look at like what's happening with the merge and so on, which today we're supposed to be getting the testnet merge, right, for Robston. So we'll be reporting on that tonight, I think. Uh, once everything's gone through and we see the big news blow up, look for a video tonight on the channel. I'm waiting on that, keeping a close eye on it. But that is only going to change the consensus mechanism. It could solve fees, obviously fees going down, but does it solve scalability? Where are we at with all that? Well, scaling Ethereum beyond the merge, and then they're talking about dank sharding here. So dank sharding would take a massive step toward turning Ethereum layer two networks into the first into first class citizens. So we've talked in the past editions of this newsletter about how Ethereum's roadmap initially planned to ship sharding alongside its switch to proof of stake consensus mechanism. While proof of stake would de uh, have decreased the network's energy costs, sharding would have been welcomed by users annoyed by Ethereum's slow transactions and high fees. Remember, the plan was called Ethereum 2.0, but it, along with ETH 2.0 moniker, have been retired in favor of a new roll-up centric roadmap. Remember, we were supposed to be getting all of these scalability features along with the merge. And I think it's, it's hard to, obviously everybody that watches the channel that comes from outside of the proof of work realm, you know, they come into this channel, they think like, oh, you know, everything you have to say about the merge is purely because you are greedy, incentivized by proof of work. And I will always admit that I have a proof of work bias, as well as, of course, going to view proof of stake as something negative. And I have my reasons and we kind of went over them. That doesn't mean, though, 
that when I talk about the fact that we are completely ignoring all of the scalability stuff, just going out into the ether, <laughs> pun intended, and poof, magically disappear, that it's okay for the rest of the network, right? So even if you're pro proof of stake, you should be a little, I think, you should be a little upset that you're not getting everything that was sold to you as part of this transition. The plan was called Ethereum 2.0. Yeah, we did that. The roll-up centric roadmap. This week, strap in for a slightly more technical summary of one of the more exciting developments currently slated to follow the merge, dank sharding. As it's currently formulated, dank sharding would take a massive step towards making Ethereum layer two networks like Optimism, Arbitrum, and ZK Sync into first class citizens. So why rollups? Sharding was proposed over five years ago as a way to help the network scale by splitting activity across several different chains. Like adding lanes to a highway, splitting Ethereum's network into shards was proposed as a way to increase the amount of activity Ethereum could process, thereby decreasing the fees, improving transaction speeds. I do have a total uh, uh, in-depth coverage of sharding if you want to get into it, but it's kind of like reading something that's not going to happen, right? It's basically lore, but I do have an entire video uh, basically deep diving what sharding is, how it functions and all of that. It's interesting at least, but like I said, to a certain extent, it's like reading, I don't know, uh, a fiction book, right? <laughs> About cryptocurrency because it doesn't seem to be what is uh, ending up being utilized for Ethereum in particular, at least. There are other uh, other coins that do utilize basically differently named versions of sharding most of the time uh, at some sort of scaling, Polkadot, for example. Although Ethereum's developers generally agree that sharding is an important next step for the network, there are lots of competing ideas on how it should work. As a result, the, wo the would-be major update to Ethereum has proven difficult to implement. While sharding has been stuck in development hell, a handful of third parties have seized the ETH scaling mantle. And this is kind of where we start getting into side chains and layer two solutions. Now, from my perspective, we've talked about this before. You should have a, a, a very secure, it can be a slow moving layer one, and then you can build everything on top of this. This is why you see things like the lightning network for Bitcoin, right? We have Bitcoin, slower layer one, you know, will work, kind of future proof, that sort of thing. For daily transactions, you build into layer two, you get the lightning network running for custody and uh, basically interactions with previous three, uh, like previous financial institutions or fiat run world, you move into layer three. Uh, I've gone all over all that. Michael Saylor covers it really good in the Lex Friedman podcast as well. It's a very long one, but you can listen to that too. Some of these solutions are basically just glorified side chains, independent blockchains that can send and receive Ethereum network transactions. As an example, users can bridge token A to a side chain, swap it for token B quickly and cheaply, and then bridge token B back to Ethereum. And this is a lot of what like people refer to as interoperability and that sort of thing. A series of transactions that cost thousands of dollars on Ethereum can be done for pennies on Polygon, Ronin, and Genosis. Genosis. Uh, there we go. Uh, since the transactions are taking place on the sidechain, they help keep some network traffic off of Ethereum. Higher traffic on Ethereum means higher fees for everyone. Of course, this convenience co often comes at a cost. While easy to spin up and use, sidechains tend to make compromises to centralization and security in the name of convenience. Right. Which is why, once again, you kind of want this setup of sidechains and layer two solutions and you still want a very strong, secure base through provided, preferably because of the incentives, uh, by proof of work. This is this is kind of how this plays out, right? Compared to sidechains, layer two rollups are considered by many developers to be the more secure way for Ethereum to scale. Rollups like sidechains take the stress off Ethereum by executing transactions on a separate blockchain. Transactions are settled on the rollup chain, bundled up, and then posted to Ethereum. Unlike side chains, rollups borrow their security from the Ethereum mainnet. They use fancy cryptography and other methods like a multi-day dispute period to allow Ethereum mainnet nodes to confirm that transactions are legitimate. 
compare this to a side chain, which just passes data back down to Ethereum network with little more than a pinky promise that the data is true. If a side chain gets exploited, in other words, Ethereum is none the wiser. As sharding has proven difficult to implement, rollups like Arbitrum and Optimism have picked up the scaling slack. These and other rollups are already enabling users to make certain kinds of transactions on Ethereum quickly and inexpensively without sacrificing security. Mind you, the Ethereum mainnet remains as slow and as expensive as ever. With these layer two networks set to handle the brunt of Ethereum's activity moving forward, sharding has become less of a priority for Ethereum developers who have shifted towards a new rollup centric roadmap. So what's dank sharding and uh, EIP 4844? The idea of sharding hasn't been put to bed yet. Enter dank sharding. And this is new to me, so I'm gonna be learning this along with you guys. Proto Dank Sharding and EIP 4844. Dank Sharding is the current design proposal for sharding on Ethereum, named for Dank Rad Feist, uh, the Ethereum researcher who initially proposed it. Dank Sharding is sharding for a rollup centric age. What follows is a high level summary of a topic that's sure to earn more attention once the merge finally comes to pass. Rather than explain these topics in depth, which can get super technical, the hope here is to place them into a broader context. Way back in 2016, before sharding was deprioritized, shards were theorized as a way to increase the total number of transactions on Ethereum uh, that could be processed. Dang sharding takes this same principle of splitting network activity into shards, but instead of using the shards to increase transaction throughput, it uses them to increase space for blobs of data. Dank sharding works using data availability sampling, a technique that allows nodes on Ethereum to verify large amounts of data just by sampling a few pieces of it. In essence, it allows Ethereum to process larger quantities of data than it could previously. A great breakdown of how this all works is in the incredibly informative and thorough Hitchhiker's Guide to Ethereum, which we will pin for later and I'll link for you guys, recently published by Delphi Digital. As Medium poster Paul, uh, Pauli Naya, so I can't say that, summarized back in January, Dank Sharding turns Ethereum into a unified settlement and data availability layer. Transacting directly on Ethereum will still be possible, but dank sharding will pave the way towards a future when vastly cheaper and quicker layer two networks can thrive. These networks, which bundle up transactions before posting them back to Ethereum, will benefit the most from an increase to the amount of data that can be posted to the chain. Dank sharding, like the rest of sharding, is complicated. There are still plenty of kinks to work out and design decisions to be made before it will be ready to hit Ethereum's mainnet. In the meantime, proto dank sharding is being proposed as a key first step towards dank sharding. Proto dank, -dank sharding will come with Ethereum Improvement Proposal 4844, whose authors include uh, Dank Rad Feist and Ethereum co founder Vitalik Buterin. The proposal involves adding a new transaction type to Ethereum, the blob carrying transaction. As Feist and Buterin explained in a recent Bankless podcast interview, Ethereum blocks can currently carry 50 to 100 kilobytes of data, but under proto dang sharding, they'll be able to carry closer to one megabyte. While this is less than the 16 megabytes that is projected under full dang sharding, a 10 times increase in data availability should be significant or should significantly decrease the cost of using rollups. Dank sharding is still a long ways out, but proto dank sharding is already being prototyped. The following is an overview of the network activity on Ethereum beacon chain over the past week. For more of an explainer, blah, blah, blah. We've been aware of all these charts before. And... I think that's going to wrap it up as far as all that goes. I'm more interested in, of course, dank sharding and where it's going. So it looks like we'll have a whole new sharding uh, lore video to cover. And I'll definitely add that to my list of things to cover as far as what their plans for scaling is outside of the rollups. We've been aware of the rollups. What does that mean though for you? If, if, if rollups are still a thing on Ethereum, what does that mean for you? Well, I think like, and obviously not investment advice, 
but it does mean that projects like Arbitrum, uh, Arbitrum Optimism, uh, uh, those types of projects are safe bets for things that will be continued to be utilized because it's needed for the scaling portion. What does it mean for the merge? You know, not much, right? Like as far as like network congestion, all that sort of problem, the scaling problems that Ethereum has, like all those are still going to be present, which means it's good news, right? Because initially, like a lot of people were going in and saying like projects like Polygon, unnecessary, Arbitrum, Optimism, unnecessary. You don't need them because with the merge and with Ethereum 2.0, we're going to get the scaling but that didn't work out to be true. So all those projects that did seem to be kind of like essentially needless post merge are now still needed post merge. So I wouldn't worry about those going away essentially is what I mean by that. I hope you enjoyed this clip from the Crypto Mining Morning Show every Monday through Friday, 7.45 a.m. Pacific and 10.45 a.m. Eastern Time. You can check out more clips here, or if you're interested in checking out the entire live show, you can check that out down here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Tuesday.